Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The View, the Church of the Larger Fellowships weekly um, webinar, Facebook Live, podcast, however you choose to join us. We're thrilled to, that you're joining us. I'm Christina Rivera, and I am joining you from Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, today, we're going to talk about finding our way home. But before we do that, we are going to do uh, introductions. So I'm going to have actually everybody introduce themselves today. And then we'll do a little bit of our weekly recap of what's going on in Unitarian Universalism and then dive right into um, what finding our way home looks like. So Aisha, you want to take it from here? Good morning. I'm Aisha Hauser at the butt crack of dawn here <clears throat> on the West Coast. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm in Seattle. Uh, Washington, and uh, really happy to be uh, with all of you folks this morning. Uh, Sir Michael Tino, I mean, Reverend Michael Tino. Good morning, Asia. This is Michael Tino joining you from Peekskill, New York. Um, it's a beautiful day here, and I'm glad to be with you. And um, I note that the good Reverend Don Fortune is still getting their, their morning coffee and will probably be joining us soon. Uh, and that Jessica Star Rockers is a uh, guest tech person this week because our, our wonderful new tech person, Margalee Belazaire is at school this week. So um, we send our love to Margalee and uh, thanks to Jessica and notes to everyone that uh, we are monitoring the chat on Facebook Live and Twitter, hashtag The View. Um, and so tweet away and comment away and your, your, our guests will get your comments. Shall we have shall we have our guests introduce themselves, Christina? Yeah, that'd be great. Michael Crumpler, how about you? Hi, I'm Reverend Michael Crumpler. I am the LGBTQ and Intercultural Programs Manager at the Unitarian Universal Association, uh, and I am located in New York City at my home office. It's a privilege uh, to be with you today. Hope. Hi, I'm Hope Johnson, sitting at my home office in Tuslow, Brooklyn, New York. Center of the Universe, I'm told. I am a member of the Congregational Life Staff, and I serve two regions, the Central East Region and the Southern Region, and it's a joy to be here today. Thank you. Tuli, go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Tuli Patel. I'm just across the river from Hope and some other river from Reverend Michael Tino, I guess. Uh, I'm in Summit, New Jersey, and this is my first time on The View, and it's an honor to be with all of you. Yay! We have a spreadsheet that we, we keep on The View about who is coming to join us and whether or not they've been on The View before or not. And it's always great when we can say we've got new people who have never been on The View before. So yes, Michael's there with his three-time world champion rings. He's got all The View rings. <laughs> and Don is back. Don, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Dawn Fortune. I am in Egg Harbor City, New Jersey. I have a vacation week, so I am dressed in my work in the garage shop clothes. Um, and my coffee, I'm still mastering the art of this little new little gizmo machine, so it took me longer than I expected. I'm sorry. But hello, everybody. I love uh, your coffee ministry on Facebook right now, Don. It is it is everything, and um, the fact that you, when you first tried that little gizmo machine, you did three uh, cups over the course of a morning with it. No, it was more than that. Yeah, it was. Um, it was. <laughs> oh my God! It was that twelve. Was, it was twelve. It was a lot. 12. That was too many. <laughs> <laughs> and and on behalf of Italians and Italian Americans everywhere, uh, welcome to our coffee. <laughs> well, I was gonna I was gonna comment that you needed to uh, we we use that, uh, but we put cafe bustelo in it. Um, and well, that's what I use. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and that will just yeah that'll set you up for the rest of the week. So. Right. That's why twelve is too many. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> So um, in the roundup this week, uh, we had a couple things that we wanted to chat about, one of which is this is a really exciting time for 
um, congregations and ordained clergy people who are in search. This is the moment in which the initial uh, round match happens. So a lot of kind of anxiety from congregations and congregational search teams who have been working so hard for so long um, and uh, ordained clergy people who are in search and hoping to get matched up. And sometimes that doesn't happen, right? Sometimes um, the, the match doesn't happen in the first round. Um, there's another round called the second round. I tend to call it the speed dating round um, where things happen a little bit faster, um, but it's always possible. So I just wanted to give a shout out to a lot of folks who are, uh, this is really um, what they're carrying and, and um, how they're moving through the next couple of days. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, it's great to hold up the fact that hopefully some really great matches are happening and there are gonna be lots of really wonderful, happy people out there. And for every, oh, we are so happy to find our minister and here's who it is announcement, there are two or three people who were hoping to get that job and didn't. Um, and in our system, uh, I think it's also worth pointing out that often the people who get multiple uh, such uh, announcements that they didn't get jobs are folks with uh, identities that marginalize them in white supremacy, cis supremacist, uh, male supremacist <laughs> culture. So, um, you know, there's a lot, a lot of stories of people, uh, ministers of color, for example, who get lots of pre-candidating interviews and no candidating offers because they're the person of color brought in so that a, a search committee can say, oh yeah, we brought in lots of diverse ministers. So I just want to, I want to hold up that reality, uh, mm -hmm. even as we celebrate all the wonderful things happening. I just, as a, um, informally, I know four different ministers in trust, which is the, the trans religious professionals organization. And all four of the people that I have been in conversation with recently, um, all are going to get very happy phone calls in about 45 minutes. So um, for trans or non-binary clergy, being settled in one year is pretty spectacular. Yay, celebration, that's so great. I still think it's a weird process, but that's all I need to say. It's super weird and I don't get it and it's okay if I don't get it, I'm not gonna ever be in it, so. It's, it's, it's match.com meets NFL draft. Which is weird for spiritual leadership, I think. Oh, no but kidding. <laughs> again, it's okay if I think it's weird. I don't have to like it, so. Yeah, and I think that um, you know the it's it's the way we do ministerial formation. I mean, we've talked about this before on the show. Um, really sets us up for um, acting in ways that that probably aren't in our best interests as as a faith and as a religion. Um, and you know, and a shout out to um, all the folks that are going to the MFC. Um, that's, that's going to be happening right now as well. It's like all, of, <laughs> let's just do it all at once, right? Let's just, let's just inject all of the anxiety into the system all at the same time. Um, and, uh, who is it on the chat? Somebody, uh, asked, um, sorry, my reading glasses are not doing properly. Hannah Perkins asked, um, how has the definition of professionals of color expanded to include non-ordained people who are doing work? And how does this impact our faith and our work? Um, and I think that's a, that's a question, you know, particularly when we're looking at what the MFC is doing um, and how search works, because search is very particular to um, ordained clergy people. Um, no other parts of our uh, religious professionals um, have this type of institutionalized search process, um, certainly not for religious educators. Um, or music directors or administrators or executive directors. Um, so there, you know, there is a question of that is a lot of um, time, talent and treasure uh, being put to one very specific um, part of uh, our religious professionals uh, pool. 
So just to, to say that. Um, so that was one part of what we were going to talk about in our roundup. The other part that we wanted to raise was um, Mid-America Region. Um, so Mid-America Region has a regional assembly, an annual regional assembly. And this year, the um, regional assembly theme uh, was called Intersectionalities. And um, it was launched and there you know, was graphics behind it. There was a big push for the registration for it. And um, some folks, uh, Asia and I were a couple of them, got this information and, and we're like, huh, this is interesting. And we went over to the websites and we, we all individually were doing this, we're kind of being curious and recognized that, um, very quickly recognized that there, the framing of this regional assembly was highly problematic um, because it was not framing uh, Kimberly Crenshaw's work uh, who um, came up with the idea of intersectionality, um, is a working um, professor and um, somebody who works on, on this um, currently. And we, we reached out to each other and said, hey, have you seen this? And yeah, a, Venn di a Venn diagram of just things doesn't, there's a specific definition. And there was literally just a Venn diagram of social justice and you, whatever it even was. I was like, oh, honey, why though? So anyway, yeah, I had to intersect that. Yeah. Well, and I think, um, is it worth spending two seconds like unpacking Kimberly Crenshaw's work a little bit. So for the folks who hear this and go, I don't know what they're talking about. Um, because Kimberly Crenshaw described intersectionality as a, an oppression that black women, and in this is in her work, faced that black men did not face and white women did not face. So it was an intersection of misogyny and racism that compounded the two of them and and was unique um, in that in that case. So just because you have two identities does not make something intersectional. And I think like people want to go, oh, we're talking about class and whiteness. <laughs> and that's intersectional. And it's just it's really not. Right. So I just I think for people going, why would the, why was that problematic? Um, I think it's worth just saying you can look up Kimberly Crenshaw's work and read it in much more depth, but it's worth the, the two second primer, I think. Yeah, and um, so, you know, we, the, there were four of us that got together, Asia, myself, um, Leslie Mack, and Lena Gardner, Lena K. Gardner, and we got together and we, we wrote an email um, to the mid america region leadership and said, hey, this is problematic. And, um, we, we subsequently found out that, um, that they had been told um, that it would potentially be problematic. And, um, you know, we're gonna give you the link to the website where um, Mid-America Region has, has issued an apology and they have rebranded the, um, the regional assembly and have said what they're you know, gonna lay out to do correctly um, in the future to try and mitigate some of this. Um, but to me really <laughs> where this, um, where this really becomes hyper problematic is this, um, this trend that we've seen, we've seen for decades, uh, where again and again and again, folks have, are saying before these things happen, hey, this has the potential to be problematic, right? And nobody listens to them. And um, Don, I, I saw you holding your head um, because it's it's just like you know um, deja vu all over again. Um, and Hope brought in you know some really Hope, if you could say what you, what you were talking about. Unfortunately, this is not a new pattern. This has been a part of who we are for a lot of years, more than 25. If I go back to the Thomas Jefferson ball, someone said this is going to be a problem. Gladys McNatt was on the planning committee. 
and it was shove it under the carpet, Gladys. We won't do this again next year. And that's how I came into that picture. This business of not being listened to, not being taken seriously. Tut tut, nice hope. But when it comes to the real work of transformation, we are, in my opinion, too often just kind of left there. Oh, hope is venting again. When actually, if, if we are taken seriously and thoughtfully, let's engage in conversation. Why is Hope saying this? Why is Dawn saying this? Why is Michael saying that? Maybe we can get to a better place where we can learn to listen to each other and work more effectively and not have all of these wonderful apologies in one month. Yeah. So we find our voices, we use them. People need to listen. So that's my hope. Yeah, I, I think that's that's exactly it. And I think part of it, um, you know, some of us were having an offline discussion about um, how democracy or the idea of democracy plays out in our congregations and that you know, if everybody doesn't agree that this is problematic, then somehow that makes it not problematic, right? Um, so if one person is saying, hey, we need to, we need to pay attention to this, um, but not everybody is supporting that, then somehow that feels to people like, um, like democracy hasn't happened. Um, and, and that is a really, really, um, narrow view of what um, democracy looks like, in, in my opinion. Isha? And aside from democracy, let me just add, it's also practicing what we preach. You know, that little phrase, this is not the UU way. Okay, what is the UU way? Exactly. And to that point, do the research. I mean, the, you know, the, so the Thomas Jefferson ball was years, what, 20 years ago? And then, um, Lareda was a couple of years ago, and it wasn't just one person with leading up to Lareda, it was several people. Um, and so let's say it's one person, it's Hope, or it's Aisha, or it's Chris. How about you do your research? It's the, Google is your friend sometimes when the Russians aren't hacking it. But anyway, you know what I mean? Like the, the, the research is there if someone, uh, and you, you world. I mean, if you didn't want to listen to one trans person, well then call three others. Oh. There's a few on staff, like where are we going? So. At this point, there's no excuse for this to continue to happen in the way it's happening. Um, we, we please stop. I don't. Who do we write a letter to? Like, please just in general stop. If something's uh, potentially going to be harmful or be problematic, please research with five. Like, do we do a step by step guide? What do we do? Like, how how do we? I don't know what to do, Michael. I think that has something to do. I mean, I think that that this has something to do with authority. And I, 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 and I think it's a deeper existential problem around voice and experience. And I feel like as, as secular progressives, you know, um, there is this trend towards the authority of your experience and the authority of your voice, which I think is important. Um, if, if something is, and I say it is, then it is. I think that that is a big part of the, the uh, core of, 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 you know, liberal progressive culture. However, and I and I and I think that that's beautiful in some in some ways. However, I do think that authority, authoritative uh, respects for, for 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 work and research and history and tradition um, ought to also be privileged alongside of that at times, depending on where you're speaking from. Just because you decide to to name something something, um, yeah, it's your right. However, if you hope to live in community with with folks and with other experiences and other voices outside of your tradition, uh, Unitarian Universalism, I think that it is important to begin practicing a like, is, has this been done before? If so, who did it? Has this been said before? If so, who said it? Um, where is this coming from? Where did I first hear this? It's not, I didn't invent intersectionality just because I thought about it or, or it's, it's consistent with, with how I've always been thinking. Someone said it before you or at least ask, has someone said it before me? And if so, who? And if so, when? Um, I think that that is just a good practice for all of us to, uh, to adhere to. And if someone says to you, hmm, this might be problematic, um, it, it's in love, not in, you know, not to tear down what you've created. 
Yeah, I'll just jump in and add that, um, unfortunately and sadly, I'm not surprised because this is how the systems get perpetuated and they keep going, right? Your systems that uphold patriarchy and white supremacy. And if the behavior is to change, you know, maybe you do need a checklist, like Aisha suggested, like, here's what you do, people. But even that is not going to land on ears that are listening and eyes that are seeing, right? So it's an interesting question of how do you actually, um, for lack of a better phrase, institutionalize the behaviors that need to be engaged in so that we can start dismantling some of this stuff. If, if I can step in and um, it occurs to me that <clears throat> this is how the UU does it. This is the UU way. When we say that's not the UU, no, it is, it is. It is how the pan is seasoned matters. Our foundational DNA organizationally is a bunch of old white guys from Harvard. And when you cook, like this is what I say, when you cook in cast iron, how you season that pan matters. And whatever you cook in it first will flavor everything you cook in it afterwards. And we are living out the seasoning that was instilled in the 1600s, where that white guys didn't need to listen to anybody else. And I think we need to, before we can before we can really start institutional change, we need to understand what the institution is and understand that this is the system. And no, it's not attractive to look at that and see our own faults and see our own shortcomings and see that um, this system was founded in a white supremacist patriarchy. Um, but if, we need to address that before we can do anything else. Otherwise it's band-aids, you know, on, on an amputation. And I think that it's important to remember, and, and actually this is something that um, we're kind of segueing into finding our way home, um, that we talked to, Tuli and I did a shared ministry um, workshop sharing at finding our way home. And one of the things that, that we note is even as, people, religious professionals of color come into these positions of power, if those positions of power are created within the patriarchy and we continue to um, inhabit them in that way, um, those systems are going to continue. Even as people from mar with marginalized identities, if we are not actively seeking to dismantle those systems, those institutional systems, um, that it's not going to magically change just because different people uh, with different identities inhabit them. It, it will change somewhat, but it, the actual dismantling part of it um, has to be very intentional. And, and that's one of the parts that I think we miss sometimes when we are seeking to quote unquote diversify, um, you know, our churches and our congregations. Um, yeah, and I would just add, like, the thing that I sit with a lot is what are the tools we're using? If you're going to dismantle the master's house, are you only going to be able to do it if you use the master's tools? And how does that make any sense? Because then the system is just perpetuated. So this is something that I sit with a lot. I don't have the answers, but I really do wonder. So, like, only if you use very academic language and, you know, have this thesis pounding thing, will anybody listen to you? Like, what, really? Um, so where is the lived experience? Where is the space for multicultural voices? So anyway, I just reflect on this a lot. Also, I've been um, <clears throat> reading, I'm taking a graduate course. So I'm reading a lot of actions of immediate witness over the years. And I'm also reading some of the stuff on commission on institutional change. And it's so frustrating because we've had the words for a long time. We've had the ideas. We're smart people, we think. We like to think, right? Whatever smart means. Um, it's, so, the, 
So we know. So every time I read something that is compelling and like makes sense from 1998 or you know 2000, I want to punch something because I'm like, wait a minute. So we have the information, and we're just literally choosing not to not to do this. And um, Gary Simpson asks, do you think that the Unitarian influences might be stronger than the Universalist influences in how the U Unitarian Universalism operates now? Absolutely. And that has not been to our fate. It has not served us well. I think listening, creating this intellectual um, excuse for knowing the right things, but not acting on it and not using our heart and how we intentionally dismantle and do things differently and who do we listen to, whose voices we center, which is how we got here. Um, and I do want to get to finding our way home because I think one of the things, I think, Hope, were you at, were you there in 2008? Because the first one I went to where uh, religious educators were invited were, was 2008 in, um, it was in a convent and there were 30 of us. Were you there? We were in California. Yes, we were in California. Yes. So yes. you, so we were there in 2000, it was the first time and, and it was 30 of us, eight religious educators and 22, it was about that and 22 ministers. And as I'm watching uh, Finding Our Way Home has grown, so it's 11 years ago, having the space and the place to intentionally say, you know what, we are POC serving a denomination of vast majority of white people and even the invitation of how that's grown is doing things differently, <clears throat> intentionally. And I do hope, and maybe it's my optimism, is is it's um, creating a ripple effect within Unitarian Universalism. So hopefully, but but yeah, I mean, things I'm reading, I'm, it just leaves me with like a headache because I'm like, why do we we knew this, we knew this, but we're still choosing to not. We're not we're not even listening to ourselves. Yeah, I think, you know, um, Everett Renee Harvey Thompson wrote that, you know, the work of Kenneth Jones and Chima Okuna, the, you know, culture of white supremacy, I mean, that document itself can be that checklist. Like, we are not at, at you know, for lack of um, a checklist in how to do this. Like, there are many checklists out there. Um, the, the reason why it continues to happen is, is the institutionalization of that white supremacy culture um, is always going to be brought back unless it is actively being dismantled. And I think finding our way home, um, you know, is one of those, those um, opportunities to, to both feel rejuvenated and refreshed, but also recognize our power in um, in leading that and centering our voices. And Julie, you were gonna say? Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, this is only my second year. I'm sorry, I don't know where I was in 2008. I was here, but I don't know what I was doing. And I, and I started going to Finding Our Way Home because the very right Reverend Cheryl M. Walker, I have to give her props, told me that I should quit going to anything else and just go to this and, and I'd be gold. And she was right, as it happens, these are the two years that she hasn't been there. So I'm very sorry that she wasn't there with me. But it was fascinating having uh, known and read those characteristics of white supremacy from the Tema Okun paper that we've all read. You know, one of the things is um, uh, like uh, perfectionism and timeliness, like everything has to be like on time and precise. And last year, it really struck me. Everything was kind of on time, but there was this little ripple that went through like, look at us, we're doing things on time. What does that say? And the same thing happened this year where people are like, oh, look, we're five minutes behind. I wonder what that indicates, right? And it was this fascinating uh, example of um, uh, battling the system, but yet recognizing what we're doing. I thought that was just absolutely amazing, two years in a row. And to that point, I mean, I, I love that you uplift that. And as, as the, you know, one of the, one of the lead organizers, um, it is even within a framework of come, finding our way home and multicultural presence and, and people of color in the same space. It just goes to show, I think that when folks say, oh, we have blue and we have drum and they have finding our way home. And, you know, like what more, what, what more can you ask for? that we're still operating in a framework of hegemony. You know, there are institutions that guide, you know, when we can begin and when we end and, 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 and how capitalism operates in that and, 
and and who you know where we are and 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 how much um, is consumed while we're there and whether or not as I as you know black queer leader you know like oh my god am I spending too much money is the budget where's the budget and and am I you know or is everybody's room in the right space and all of these things that are constantly there that while the intention is to create a lovely space for people of color, <laughs> religious professionals of color to come together and have a wonderful time, underneath all that is still a mountain of, you know, institutional racism, structural racism, you know, like, you know, and, and, and all the other isms and, 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 and phobias that, that come alongside of that. Um, but I think that, that naming that is so important. And I think that our community has named that, Michael. Um, we've seen some changes. For example, worship wasn't just worship in the typical way. Even the timing of the worship later in the day made a difference and more, I think, really positively reflected so much of who we are. I think we, we allowed, because we knew what you just said, we made way for renovation in the midst of the conference. And so there was some flexibility. We changed things around at the last second. And I love that. So I, I want to say that I agree. And yet I think the community itself made some efforts to reflect the learnings that we've had in the recent past. And for that, I was really grateful. And what was heartbreaking to me, Hope, was I had a real um, a consciousness that I could never do even one iota of what went on at finding our way home in my own congregation. I would not be able to do it. Oh, that's, yeah, that's the heartbreaking piece. Yeah, that's hard. Yeah, the, the re-entry is real. Uh, you know, we talked about it. I, I think we did a shout out last week or the week before, whatever week we got it back and just said, you know, folks, you know, if you could just tone down the white nonsense, you know, for a week for people, for your religious professionals of color re-entering, that would be awesome. I mean, if you could tone it down all the time, that would be really, really awesome, but at least, you know, for give us a week back. Uh, and, and, you know, so many of our colleagues were, you know, reaching out for support coming back um, because you, you get a glimpse of what Unitarian Universalism um, is at its heart. I, I'm trying to reframe myself from saying what it could be because I think it, it is what it, when we are in POC UU space, I think that is what Unitarian Universalism is at its heart. And, um, and it's hard, it's, it's super hard to come back into um, how it's expressed right now um, in a way that is really harmful um, to our UUPOC um, siblings. Um, Christina? Christina, you know, um, I'm the one with the name Hope Optimism personified. Since we've come back from finding our way home, I know because I'm rela in relation with some of you on this view episode, we're doing the work of keeping the community together. And I just wanna say, let's keep in touch with each other. And, and Tuli, I hear what you're saying and it's real. But the work I've been doing like all of yesterday was working on two different things that came after finding a way home. And because it was a strong conference, I'm engaged with my colleagues here even on the phone. So let's stay together. Let's stay together. So to that point, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about it, if, if, if I may. Um... The, the agenda, the programming. I know a lot of folks who are, who are viewing us probably don't even know what we're talking about. <laughs> finding Our Way Home. Uh, so Finding Our Way Home is, is, is an annual conference that, uh, as I've learned from Asia, uh, it was opened up beyond uh, ministers uh, back in 2008. So right now uh, we welcome ministers, religious professionals, um, musicians, administrators, seminarians, and UUA staff of color. And uh, I love that that Tuli mentioned um, that they just be, began attending 
you know, just two years ago, because that speaks to like, how do people find out about it and who's invited and who knows about it? And, and those are issues that we are, uh, you know, struggling to address. Uh, of course, it is uh, intended for folks to be able to come without worry of financial burden and what that means, however, is that's also ambiguous, right? Because it's like, well, how much is finding our way home cost? Well, how much can you, how much can you afford to contribute? And then that become, becomes an issue as well. But essentially it's been an annual com a retreat um, uh, that, that uh, centers the experiences of our religious professionals of color. And last, this year it was in Miami, Florida. And last year it was in Albuquerque and the year before in Baltimore. And I don't know where it was before that, <laughs> but uh, so, so so others on the call could, can speak to previous locations. However, um, it's grown uh, this year. We had uh, 150 regist registrants, uh, but then there were cancellations of about nine, and then there were uh, flight issues, travel issues due to weather. So we ended up being about 130 strong. Um, the beautiful thing about finding our way home is that other institutions. Uh, organizations will arrive earlier or stay after. So um, uh, there's a few organizations that I won't name because I, I can't, wouldn't, wouldn't miss them all, wouldn't include them all. So it kind of becomes a time where folks just kind of come together, a homecoming, if you will. It feels very similar to a family reunion. As a matter of fact, I felt like I was just like chairing the family reunion committee as I do in my own family. And, and, uh, and so it, it felt really, really good to be a part of. Um, and so even in leading it, it didn't feel like work, it felt like family. It felt like something I usually do every other year in August with my own family. And, uh, and it was a beautiful, beautiful uh, event. This year, what was different is uh, from the two years that I attended since I've been on UUA staff is that we, well, last year we did a survey of what, focusing on what folks want out of it. Uh, Janice Marie Johnson usually, uh, it's, it's, it's Janice's portfolio and she does a fabulous job with it. Uh, originally Janice was, was uh, in her calendar, she wouldn't be here this year. And so that was how I ended up uh, leading it. But as the UUA would have it, Janice did not get to not be here this year. <laughs> so, but it was beautiful that Janice could, could kind of enjoy the conference more than, than, than normal. But I do need to name that Janice Marie Johnson is largely responsible for the Finding Our Way Home we have today. And, and, uh, and, and we are grateful to the hard work that she has invested in this. However, we did uh, alter the format this year to allow more flexibility and freedom. Uh, we knew we would be in, you know, in Miami. We knew that uh, it would be large. We knew that folks did not want to be in one room all day for three days um, before they just went back and delved into the work. So we made it flexible by offering workshops, option, optional workshops. Uh, where folks could just kind of like navigate, negotiate their time. Someone named that uh, worship was later rather than waking up at nine o'clock and throwing people into worship. Um, we did it like right before lunch at like 12 o'clock and that was a beautiful thing. Um, and so folks just had a little bit more freedom to, to, to be with their bodies and to, and to go where they wanted to go. We recorded a lot of the sessions to make them live. Uh, we lived them. So that folks, if you couldn't get to the space that you could still enjoy what's there. And if you couldn't get to the conference, you could still have access to what happened. So uh, many of those were live, but if when they weren't live because of internet issues, we recorded them and they will be posted and shared within the next uh, few weeks as we gather all of our, gather ourselves and rest from the time. Uh, but that's a little bit about what finding our way home is, but the hope is that we could all come together and see who we are. And it's just so cathartic to see hundred and. 30 or so people of color who are feeling what, what I feel and who are, um, but who are, as, who are as gifted as I am and vice versa, coming together to do this work and the power in, in the space is, is, is electric. And, and, uh, and I'm just really, really privileged to be able to be a part of, of something like this. Um, when I decided to become a queer minister and, and, and answer that call, I immediately assumed that I would be in white spaces, white progressive spaces, uh, in New England somewhere. I visioned myself in a church in Connecticut being the only black queer person, <laughs> but I could be gay and, and pray. Um, and, and, and so the idea that I get to be in the work in this way is a dream. And, and so I thank you all. I think uh, Janine Gelsinger, uh, who's watching writes, what does it say about us that we have finding our way home and places for POC to heal 
from the injuries that we as white you use, I'm going to add, are constantly afflicting, inflicting, where is the investment of white you use to stop the injuries before they start to break down this injurious structure and patterns? That's an awesome question. Uh, yeah, I, because one of the things I was going to say is um, the unclenching I feel when when I'm at Finding Our Way Home or POC only space is that I don't feel I um, I think it's it's a, it's almost a, an embodied unclenching. Like I feel like my muscles aren't as tense, and I'm not constantly thinking. Well, I mean, I really do watch what I say more often than not, even though it doesn't seem like it. But especially <laughs> finding our way home, I am completely not um, watching much of what I say. Uh, but but it feels um, it's it's almost a spiritual unclenching. It's like oh, we we are just together. We're with, you know, we're, we're our people and the worships, mm, y'all don't know what you're missing, what you use. So maybe that's the incentive is you'll get awesome worship if you cut this shit out. I don't know. Ooh. Okay, that's me. Yeah, I was going to add uh, one of the most interesting things for me has been, uh, so I think, and Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, that the largest subset of the attendees are from the African-American tradition, right? So many of the songs we sang, speaking to the worship, uh, obviously were very, not obviously, were rooted in the tradition that the majority of the attendees came from. It's not my history. It's not my uh, culture. I was raised in India, right? And so it doesn't have the depth of meaning for me, but it doesn't matter because I can join in, I can drop in, and I can experience it at whatever level make sense for me. And that to me was just phenomenal to watch, right? And to observe myself, you know, kind of from the top of the room saying, wait, this song has, like, I don't even know what the song is, but it doesn't matter that I don't know what the song is. Here I am with these people and we're all in it together. And Marisol, we were on a different call for something else uh, earlier this week. She sort of described it as different cells in an organism. And some cells are this is my bit now. Some cells are expanding and contracting more than others, but we can all drop in and be part of that large organism to whatever extent we feel like. Um, so on our chat, we have um, Ty Resendez de Perez writes, I want folks to understand how important it is, is finding our way home is for professionals working in a faith field to have a space to do true, deep soul work for themselves. I want folks to love the religious professionals working in their congregation so deeply that they go to their ministers and say, hey, I know about this retreat and I think my staff of color need to be there. That is so important. Um, we heard from uh, President Susan Frederick Gray that um, the EUA is working on a system to be able to um, have religious professionals of color opt into a, a database to be able to help track not just, um, you know, our, our success and, and the, you know, and, and movements throughout UU, but so that we can get invited to things that support us, right? Um, I'm with Julie. I was a religious professional for several years before I I found out from another colleague about finding our way home. Um, but but to what I what I love about what you said is that you're saying you want other people to be going to leadership in your congregations and saying, how can we support the religious professionals of color serving Unitarian Universalism in our congregations? And that is to me is so important. Um, right before finding our way home, I think, Michael, it was your Facebook post where I think you were wishing well, all of us from, you know, that were, that were on our way to Miami. And I replied back to you as, you know, how wonderful would it be if religious professionals, you know, the week before going to finding our way home started finding, you know, little care packages on their desk of, you know, just a tube of suntan lotion or, you know, earplugs because you're going to have a roommate or, uh, you know, chocolates or, you know, whatever a person thought would be meaningful to that person so that they knew that they were being held by a congregation supporting them in going. 
um, as opposed to wondering why they were leaving, um, how it was being paid for, um, you know, what they weren't going to be doing, what time off were they taking, is this professional development time, is it vacation time, um, and what a shift that would signal um, in our um, in our faith. And um, every for the past three years now, before finding our way home, I've just taken up a collection for direct support for religious professionals of color who are going because while the Michael's right, the UUA picks up enormous amount of the tab for, for this conference, um, there are still meals that, that you know, aren't part of the conference. There's still you know, some transportation you know, here and there that, that isn't covered. Um, and people, there are folks that you know, do the circuit of, of sermons giving on Sunday as part of their uh, as part of their income and they're not getting you know that income or the or other income that they have to have to leave um, and so um, that collection has grown over the, the course of the years um, this year, last year we raised two thousand dollars this year our goal was four thousand and we were just short of the four thousand mark um, but that that money, you know, is given directly to religious professionals of color to, you know, tide them over, you know, replace income, do whatever it is that that they need to be able to be really present at finding our way home and not worried about how are they going to pay the light bill um, or, you know, can they go out with friends because um, maybe they can't afford to, you know, even eat or get a drink, you know, with friends that, that are going out. So. Um, I just challenge folks who are listening, you know, this year, what can you do over this year to really show religious professionals of color that you care about their ministry um, to Unitarian Universalism in your congregation? And I'm, I'm personally trying to stop saying that I serve a congregation. I'm trying to reframe it and say, I serve Unitarian Universalism um, in a congregation. Um, so, so what are our congregants, how are they serving Unitarian Universalism um, yeah. and supporting our, our folks? Christina, that, uh, that response that you had, uh, uh, and for those who are not my Facebook friends, I just, I simply posted blessings on the journey and may your time at finding your way home, finding our way home be renewing and, and refreshing to you, right? So like I was some, it was like some very simple thing and your response to that really struck me. Christina. Uh, so first of all, I want to say that there might be care packages in the mail to people uh, coming. So if if my colleagues of color start getting little packages in the mail before finding our way home, they're from me. Um, <laughs> I'll put my name on it so you don't have to worry, like, what is this package that just came to me? Um, well, now I'm so, feeling left out because I didn't get a package. Uh, nobody got a package. That I'm going to do this next year. I, I didn't have enough warning to get this underway, Asia, but you're getting one next year, let me tell you. Uh, but it, it really struck me, Christina, that, uh, that anyone would, would have the sort of reactions that you describe. And, I, and it maybe shouldn't strike me, right? I shouldn't be surprised by the ways that white supremacy rears its head in our, in our uh, like I should stop being shocked as you're, you're as your white colleague, I should just stop. But like my experience of finding our way home as a white minister is that my colleagues like have their hearts filled up for, for however long that you're there and you come home full, like overflowing with, with love and, and connection and spirit. And I'm like, why wouldn't I just be joyful that you get that right like why wouldn't i just be glad so unitarian universalism we're going to be glad next year i'm looking at you unitarian universalism um white my white folks i like i see you all the white folks out there we're going to be glad next year and i'm gonna i'm gonna like be the 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 head cheerleader um so white folks, we're, we're joining a team. We're going to be glad. We're going to make our congregations glad. Uh, we're going to, and we're going to like cut the nonsense out. <laughs> so, 
and we're going to do that before the, and we're going to do that before the trust retreat too <laughs> yes 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 because it's a similar thing right my you know my colleagues go to this and are filled up why wouldn't i be glad so somebody wrote on the chat um sorry did i interrupt you michael are you okay okay about allowing people in uh about allowing poc who are in spirit in, in in leadership positions so i take it they mean um not part of the religious professionals to attend and this came up at finding our way home when one of our members Reverend Clyde Grubb said, imagine if we were to open it up to people of color in our congregation who are not um, on staff. And that was interesting. And I'd love to hear what people think about that. Yeah, so I, I, I that actually came up in several ways. I mean, not only, um, you know, have we talked about, even, even in like folks who are leaders of, of, of affinity groups, like drum and blue and and whether or not if you are in the steering committee of drum or if you're in the steering committee of blue but not a religious professional of color or religious professional um ought you be and that was a difficult conversation uh for us to have we had folks uh for, you know request you know for for non-religious professional folks to be there and the and, and i would name it as a challenge and i would also name it as an opportunity for all of, for, for religious professionals of color to to begin thinking about how are we serving lay and just general congregants of color and what are we creating? Like if this is a huge meaningful opportunity uh, for religious professionals of color, how can that, uh, you know, just spray out into Unitarian Universalism into congregations that are serving Unitarian Universalism Hear me, Christina. Um, and <laughs> and 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 what does that look like? I mean, certainly, perhaps finding out it may not be next year or the year after that finding our way home is open to, to lay leaders. However, what would that look like? Uh, you know, to have a finding our way home, you know, that is sponsored by religious professionals of color for um, Unitarian Universalists of color. Certainly, there are blue convenings and there are are, are drum retreats and so forth. Um, but as religious professionals of color, I think that that challenge is, is to us to begin to think more broadly about how can we recreate what Finding Our Way Home has become in other ways for, for, for people of color and for Unitarian Universalism. But it's difficult saying no to, 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 to folks. And I think that right now our project is largely making sure that all of the religious professionals of color even know and know enough in advance to be able to get there. And when they get there, are able to really, really enjoy the time. Uh, but there is talk about other ways to actualize uh, that idea. So thank you for the question. Well, we are coming close to the top of the hour. I just wanted to um, give Michael and Aisha and Hope um, and truly an opportunity if there was anything that you were coming on the view wanting to say about finding our way home. And also, um, Michael, I, I know that you recognized Asia as part of that steering team. If you could maybe give a shout out to the rest of the team, that would be awesome. Yes, I'll do that so that before I forget. So this year, uh, uh, like I said, the leadership was different. I'm, you know, a, a, a part of changing the format was changing the, the leadership and taking uh, some of it off of the shoulders of uh, what was then multicultural growth and witness, but it's still multicultural ministries. That's another view uh, episode. Uh, <laughs> but um, so this year, last year after the uh, retreat, we issued a survey and asked folks to uh, become involved. And Asia Hauser and Adam Dyer uh, and Mari Christina uh, Blasidis, uh, you know took us up on that, as well as um, Yuri Okamoto, uh, uh, Rayla. Uh, Rayla Balderson. Well, yes. And so we had a really, really strong uh, team of folks to come in and help. Uh, Dawn Robinson, who uh, works with the, uh, you know, Insti uh, Equity and Change uh, area of the Unitarian Universalist Association also was a huge part of doing this and uh, I had a loss in my family and had to take a hiatus. I did not know that when I called this team together. Uh, so uh, the, the weeks immediately preceding finding our way home, I was a little bit off the grid and I couldn't have 
I couldn't have uh, asked for a better team to come in and help lead. So I am really, really excited for this. And I'm really, really excited uh, for next year. And we're going to be inviting more people uh, in my absence. Uh, Dr. Janice Marie Johnson stepped back in and, and, and picked up. And so it was just an amazing, amazing leadership. I was able to arrive at finding our way home and just kind of like resume where I had left off three weeks prior, which if you're not involved in an event three weeks immediately up to the event, all of you know that, that that's just a critical time. And, and they all carried that uh, baton for me. And I um, came back in and just began twirling it as if I hadn't, you know, Mr. B. So it was just really, really, really great, great uh, to, to serve alongside of them. I will say that um, that for finding a way home is not only a respite. For many of us, it is a lifeline to Unitarian Universalism. Mm -hmm. And I want to see it continue to grow and continue to grow and continue to grow. And Michael Tino, I listened to what you said about our colleagues. It would surprise you to know how many of our colleagues, white colleagues, are gatekeepers. I hope that that would be part of the trend. It, it would not surprise me, Hope, unfortunately. It would, it would just right. disappoint me. <laughs> it's disappointing to me too. So get the word out, not only to the white folk, but to everyone that this opportunity for life line to Unitarian Universalism does exist. Yeah. Yes, that's everything everybody said. Um, yeah, it's, um, it is, it is, it is the, uh, it's been a lifeline. It's been also a glimpse of the potential of Unitarian Universalism. And uh, Marcus Fagliano said, uh, bring me more drum, Diverse Revolutionary Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministries and Black Lives of UU revivals. Um, so what would that look like if we plan for POC space revivals? Um, yay. So putting that into the universe. Let's make it happen, folks. Julie, any last sharing from, from Finding Our Way Home? Just so grateful for the opportunity. Just delighted that uh, Reverend Sherilyn Walker told me about it. I'm not sure that I would have heard. Like, I don't know. Um, I don't know why I hadn't heard. I'm still thinking about that. Like, like why, why didn't I know? I've been in this position 15 years. It's ridiculous that this is just my second year of coming, but I'm very grateful for those two years. I will never miss it again. And she was absolutely right that I might go to other conferences, but I'm not missing this one. Amen. What a great way to end, to end the Finding Our Way show, Finding Our Way Home episode. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, if you joined us live, I think um, Jessica said it may have been our live, largest live crew um, viewing party. I'm getting dings from the Phoenix viewing party right now. Hi, how you all? Shout out. Hi, Phoenix. <laughs> Um, and if you're listening to this on the podcast, make sure that you return for more. We will be back next week and we look forward to seeing you all then. Bye. 